Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? I haven't spoken to you for a while. Let's just get out of the way of this guy. Yeah, what a lovely day. Sort of a late uh, sunny day in the uh, middle of September and it's still 20 degrees, or it was 20 degrees yesterday. So I'm on my way back to work. I've had, just had a week off. I had a week off in uh, Portugal, Madeira, to uh, be precise. If you've never been to Madeira, it's basically it's a volcanic island. It's like uh, uh, in the middle of uh, the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Africa. And uh, while uh, Tenerife belongs to the Spanish, Madeira belongs to the Portuguese. So they are quite different in character. Well, Tenerife is completely uh, overdeveloped and full of uh, bars, you know, doing fish and chips and big English breakfasts and uh, that sort of thing. And Madeira is. Uh, is all is almost completely um, the opposite. There's there's you know everyone's in bed by eleven o'clock. Uh, the place is just uh, covered in vegetation. Gets a lot of rainfall. Well, I mean you know, being in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, I suppose it cops more rainfall than the, than the, the equivalent bit of Africa at the same latitude. But uh, covered in bananas and vines mainly and uh, lots of uh, a, bit, a bit of tourism I suppose absolutely no advertising on the uh, no advertising on the roads no billboards no graffiti the uh, architecture is a combination of two sort of Portuguese colonial style which is uh, sort of very recognizable as the you know You've got to think of the the sort of the bank at the end of um, oh what was it uh, Bruce Cassidy uh, Br Cassidy whatever his name was Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and uh, sort of whitewashed and uh, terracotta tile roof and and lots and lots of vertical bars on the windows you know that sort of style so uh, no high rise. So no, and uh, but then what they've done is they they've introduced like a second type of architecture into the island, which is more like a brutalist South Bank type, which the you know the sort of thing that the Prince of Wales would go mad about, just the concrete box, undisguised. I mean, you know, quite obviously concrete, um, and um, and uh, that's the sort of hotel we stayed in it was just like it was like a multi-story car park in outward appearance inside it was uh, it was I wouldn't say it was luxury it was certainly had there was lots of space and I mean the service is good everyone in Madeira is very friendly but um, anyway we had a nice holiday I won't bore you with my holiday snaps but uh, the other interesting thing about Portugal and Madeira is that Madeira is uh, pretty much 11 degrees to the west of the Greenwich Meridian, which is, and bearing in mind that the globe is divided into 24 time zones and 360 degrees therefore 15 degrees is approximately a time zone and they're 11 degrees west so they're nearly one complete time zone west of the UK and yet they are on the same time so why are they on the same time as the UK well the answer is that the UK is on the same time as Portugal and they although they are one time zone to the left of Portugal prefer obviously because they're a Portuguese colony and they do business with Portugal they prefer to run on the same time so what does that mean well that means that although you're uh, you know when you when you fly somewhere whether it's South Africa or Gambia or, or anywhere and they say well you're you know you're on the same time zone as the UK you think oh that's great you know no jet lag but if you fly to Madeira then um, 
your what happens is you wake up at like eight o'clock in the morning and it's pitch black and uh, but, but in the evening the other side of that coin is in the evening when you're going out for dinner or you know you want to watch the sunset go down it goes down about half past nine whereas in in the UK it's sort of getting dark about half past seven so uh, they have far more of a um, potential to and you do see this uh, in Madeira where what will happen is that at five o'clock or six o'clock uh, everyone will knock off work and then an entire family will meet up on the beach and and go for a swim for half an hour and uh, it's it's a you know it's lovely to be able to enjoy the evenings and have the lighter evenings um, whereas uh, so basically what they've got is they've got double summer time and this is something that I've been very keen on for a long time I think in the UK we have the clocks out of kilter for one hour the whole year round and I know there's been some talk at the European level of staying with summertime all year round which would be good but um, you know to have summertime in the winter would be good but I think that we should put the clocks still put the clocks forward in the summer <clears throat> and have double summertime in the summer and summertime in the winter and what that would mean is that we would take one hour off the day well, like when it's light at five o'clock and four o'clock in the morning that we never ever see that daylight and tack it on the end of the evening when we're all up and having barbecues and and generally would like to stay out uh, drinking till 10 o'clock or whatever so you know for, for all this uh, palaver and hoo-ha about kids going to school and Scottish farmers and all the usual you know crap you hear about objecting to double summer time there's I've just suddenly discovered a country that does it for other reasons you know that, that does it because they are a colony and one time zone around the world from the parent country and stick to the parent country's time zone and then effectively get uh, double summer time and uh, nobody thinks anything of it other than the fact that uh, you know it's dark it's, it's only starting to get light at eight o'clock in the morning which I, you know to be honest with you who cares you know it just means that you have your cornflakes with the Sun coming up but in the evening you've got far more choice about uh, what you want to do after work anyway so I'm going back to work now the uh, as you would expect with someone with my immense technological capabilities I have been able to stay in touch with the practice and at the moment we're in the middle well we're, I say the middle we're, we're in the process we're at the start of the process of changing our phone number and that's because we don't our phone number doesn't belong to us it belongs to the innovation center where we're situate and if we were ever to relocate then we would lose that phone number overnight and I don't want that I mean a lot of the goodwill is uh, invested in the phone number so I want to have our own portable phone number so I've got a Vonage system and we're using the Vonage number or changing over to the Vonage number although we'll keep both numbers working you know for the time being and uh, so whereas we were able to ask the receptionist to answer the calls that came through on the centre number um, we did have a number of calls come through on the new number and the way that the new ha number handles calls that aren't picked up is that um, is that it forwards them to my mobile <laughs> if nobody answers so there I am you know sitting in the hotel room in Madeira and uh, you know oh, I've got a toothache I've got a toothache well because I can dial into my practice system and this is not a facility of the actual practice system itself it's a, just a it's a free program called team viewer and it allows you to control your desktop from a, another computer anywhere in the world and it's quite simple to set up and it, it is just completely free and it's fully functional providing you you're not really using it commercially they don't mind too much and um, 
it allows you to sit down and you know use the keyboard and the mouse as though you were sitting in the office and so with a little bit of you know saying oh do you mind if I ring you back in five minutes I was able to um, book the odd appointment in which and I know you know I can hear people saying well you're on holiday you know you should get away from all that but actually the fact that I'm on holiday means that I don't mind it too much because you know I've I've done things on holiday that I wouldn't have done normally, you know, I've, I've spent one day I spent in bed. One day I just spent it in bed. Uh, I mean, arguably I needed to because you have a day when all the your gut bacteria change over and believe me, you're better off being in bed on one of those days. But, uh, you know, I've been watching chess videos for three hours worth of chess videos. I mean, I would never ever get a chance to watch chess videos for three hours in a normal life <laughs> a normal working day so you know funnily enough a little phone call from a patient have a chat is, is a, like a little divertimento I don't mind a little so anyway the point is that you don't have to stay out of touch now well where are the staff, you're asking? Where are the staff? Well, with a single-handed practice, um, you have a decision to make, don't you, about the staff? And I just basically gave them both the week off. The hygienist had to take the week off because uh, a lot of her patients come in and have uh, scan and polish with their checkup, and <clears throat> if they find out that the dentist is not gonna be there, so they're not gonna be able to have their checkup, then they just rebook on a day when we are both going to be there so we have a they have uh, they come back when they can have a so long and the short of it is the hygiene gets cancelled and it's not fair on her to leave her with a, one patient at nine o'clock one patient at eleven o'clock one patient at three o'clock in the afternoon so so we cancel the day and uh, you know I could have said to the staff look between the two of you I expect you to cover the phone but really the phone calls are the only phone calls we get are, are from new patients so we get about well we're going to get a lot today but half a dozen in a week I would say new patients and it's not worth the loss of goodwill to force them to insist that they sit there and stare at a phone that isn't ringing and might not ring all day you know a complete waste of a day of their life which at my age you do start to appreciate the value of a day so you know and by giving them the week off I've, I've engendered a massive amount of positive goodwill and I don't even I'm not you know when I say well you forced them to take a week holiday you know you forced them I haven't forced them I don't even know if I'll count it as a week's holiday I'll just count it as a week when they were absent without leave on full pay and I just didn't bother to chase it up that's the best way to do it because you know you know why because that the work that we would have done in that week will be done it will be made up you know it is booked into this week and next week and so they're going to be working their little asses off this week and next week sterilizing and generally putting instruments out and scrubbing and stuff like that they're going to do that work anyway so we'll just be more busy for the three weeks of the month that we weren't off the second week of the month I've found is a good week to have off because um, in the first week you tend to get everyone booked in for checkups all the checkups are booked in the routine recalls and then um, you don't really want to be off the last week because the last week is the week you have to juggle all the money and make sure you've got enough money to pay the bills and and uh, staff and you know the bank and everything so that leaves you with the second or third week so I suppose you could do either but I tend to I've just felt more comfortable taking the second week off knowing that I've got two weeks to make sure that I've got enough money in the account at the end of the month to to last another month and that is all you just what I say as you do you just live month to month until uh, you get a letter saying that your mortgage is paid off or your loan is paid off or something don't 
don't think ahead. You know, it's the same way, you know, old Mao said, well, every journey starts with a single step. And I think that, you know, there he was, he was talking about just having the, the sort of the courage to embark upon a long journey. The, or the fact that people say, well, no, you'll never achieve that. And you say, well, I know perhaps I won't, but I'm going to just achieve, achieve a tiny part of something, a tiny part of it. And then another tiny part of it, and then you know we'll see whether we achieve it or not. But I think that the my attitude is more uh, the sort of attitude that I had when I was a boy, when I had to walk to school and walk home from school, and it wasn't a massively long distance; it was just over a mile. So I mean, you know, it's not like I walked ten miles to school or anything, <laughs> like like these African children walk ten miles for water every day. It was just a mile, but the point was it was, the best way to do it was, was not to look ahead. It was to look down at your feet. And, and just, uh, I mean, I used to read a book. And because you do the same journey every day, you tend to get to know every lamppost and, and road sign. So, you, you know, after a couple of days, you start walking into things. And uh, and I think you know if you're on a long journey, uh, just stare at your feet and do one step at a time. Don't don't look ahead, you know. Apart from just to glance from time to time in the general direction of where you're going, so you're not walking around in circles. But uh, that's you know, and I have paid my mortgage off once already, so. Uh, and then, you know, my wife decided that we needed a larger house, so so I'm, I'm going to have paid off two mortgages at the end of my lifetime. So, um, you just don't worry about it, you know, just get through the day, just get through the week, and but mainly just get through the month. And I don't have that many more months to go, I think I'm, I've got about six years to go on the mortgage. So... Six only seventy-two more months, isn't it? It's a bit better than the uh, the sort of the three hundred months that you've got when you start off. Is that right? Twenty-five times twelve, two hundred. It's about three hundred, isn't it? Yeah, three I'm three hundred, and I'm down to seventy-two. It doesn't sound enough, does it? That's not right, is it? Six twelve is seventy-two, so I've got seventy-two months left. And if I started off with twenty-five twelves. 250, 300, 300 down to 72. Oh, that is right, yeah, because 72, 75 is a quarter of 300, isn't it? So, and six is about a quarter of 25. So, yeah, okay. Still got it. I still got the old mathematical brain. So, anyway, what 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 do you do? You know, I mean, if you haven't got any appointments for a week and you've got people ringing up and saying they've got toothache, you um you just say, look, ring Monday morning nothing I can do for you now but ring Monday morning and that with any problem solving that's a good general rule to be honest uh, it doesn't matter what it is you know someone finds a fly in their porridge or or uh, you know you've got uh, complaining that their dentures are rubbing or whatever uh, providing you're doing everything within your power to try and fix the problem you're doing as much as you possibly can to try and fix the problem they can't complain that's it. It completely takes the wind out of their sails. They can't. They cannot complain if they, if you are doing, and they accept that you are doing everything within your power to try and fix the problem. There is nothing more that you could possibly do to try and fix the problem. That that is the end of the complaint. That is it. You know, they might then start complaining about historically about you know, and if they do, you know, if they do start complaining and saying, well. I think the problem is because you didn't do this right or you didn't do that right and then I t generally tend to terminate the arrangement and I say look I'm sorry I can't you know you can see I'm I'm in with in, in good I'm making a good faith effort to sort out your problem but if you're going to allege that I am the cause of your problem then you know we're not going to we're not going to be able to do much more um, and this is most typically uh, summed up by, by for example, um, let's use a denture as an example, where you, you, you've got a patient who says the dentures are rubbing, and she says that she thinks that they're the wrong shape and they're the wrong size, 
and, and that was because you didn't take the impressions properly. Yeah? Something that, that is out, outside of your power to, uh, to remedy. Um, and so when a patient does say something silly like that, um, I, I don't automatically, I don't just jump down their throat. I don't just say, well, you know, uh, you know, now, now you've said that, so that's the end of it. You know, I say, well, look, you know, we, we did, we took a great deal of care over the impressions. But then if they then repeat it and say, no, well, you know, but did you really, you know, in my opinion, you rushed, you rushed the impressions and I don't, I think that's the problem. I think you just didn't take the impressions properly. And then if they then, you know, make it quite clear that they are alleging that, you know, in effect that you're negligent in, in, a, in a previous, you know, a prior stage, then, then I say, well, look, you know, I, you, you know, you're not going to have any confidence in my ability if, if that's what you think about my ability, then obviously you won't have any confidence in my ability now to, to do things properly. You know, if you think that I've uh, accepted impressions that were taken negligently or, or took, you no, know, you know, didn't exercise my duty of skill and care over taking the impressions, then how are you going to accept that I've exercised skill and care over any sort of remedial work? It happens very rarely, but that's a couple of tips, you know, how to defuse a complaint, do everything within your power to try and fix it, make sure that the person understands that you're doing everything within your power, you know, in this case, uh, I didn't say, look, I'm sorry, but you're talking to me on a sunbed in, in uh, Madeira, so I can't see you. I just said, look, no, we've got no availability this week. Uh, you'll have to come back on Monday. Or, or a Monday is the earliest day. First thing, Monday morning is the earliest we can possibly see. And so as a result, I have probably, I probably will have a couple of people ring me or ring the surgery first thing Monday morning saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the lady who's, um, you know, had the toothache and had been taking painkillers for a month and it hasn't gone away, blah, blah, blah. And then we'll get them booked in and we'll, we'll get them in booked in today. Not, I'm not gonna get them. You can't ask them to ring first thing Monday morning and say, yeah, I've got an appointment on Wednesday. You have to tell them either to come straight down or come in at three o'clock or something. And if, if it's a genuine problem, and it usually is if they have rung, then they will generally accept whatever time you give them. You know, you say come in at 12 o'clock, and they'll, that's fine, that's fine. Um, the one who says, uh, you know, uh, I've got a toothache, and you say, can you come in at four o'clock? And they say, no, I can't, uh, because I've got a piano lesson. Can I come in Thursday? That's not a toothache, you know, that's just somebody wants an early appointment. or oh, don't break that to a level two hurricane. <sighs> anyway. Who knows? Back to their old routine. Driving to work, getting stressed, driving home from work. I don't know whether I'm going to change much as, as a result of the holiday. And the, the holiday was just nice to uh, to do nothing. You know, we really I didn't normally when we go on holiday, uh, we go somewhere where it's like uh, there's something to do culturally. There's something to see. There's some ruins. There's some churches. There's uh, I don't know. And I hire a car, generally hire a car from the airport. <coughs> Hello, no, oh, there's an ambulance. Which I did in Crete, hired a car. I parked it in a supermarket, some bugger, you know, who didn't know the length of their car, was sort of maneuvering in the supermarket and just grazed it at the back. So fortunately we had uh, like a comprehensive insurance policy so it didn't cost me anything but like it took 45 minutes at the airport for them just to double check the paperwork and ask me if I knew who'd done it and I said no it was done in a car park and uh, you know and you're constantly worried aren't you about scuffing the curb or scuffing a wheel uh, plate whatever they're called. 
or an in the, in Crete, the roads are rubbish. You know, I mean, they've got uh, they've got massive massive potholes. For the most part, the roads are okay, but they've got these potholes and they don't fix them. You know, but the locals know them and they know where they are and they know to sort of slow down and drive around them. Whereas if you're a tourist and you're coming along, you're sort of bowling along 40, 50 miles an hour, and then and you have to really, really keep an eye out because you know there'll be these unmarked, unfixed, and really quite deep potholes that are more than capable of bending a a wheel rim. But everything in Portugal, um, in Madeira, was being very, very mountainous. There's no flat surfaces in Madeira. It's it's, it's very steep, and um, they've. But they've had a ring road built with uh, European money, and basically most of it is tunnel. What happens is it comes out. It's like a. It's like an, an octagon or a, or a dodecagon or something. It's like a ten-sided circle, where the tunnel pops out at some sort of what formerly uh, what what was a fishing village. And then you've got a little roundabout and you can go down into the fishing village or if you go round the roundabout and go, you've got the next tunnel which takes you through the rock into the next fishing village and then you go a little round, a little round and then to the next tunnel that takes you to the next fishing village and you go round the coast like that, just in mainly in tunnels, you know. It's, and they've got no, no uh, land to put a ring road. It all, it's all sheer cliff. So they've, and uh, I mean, you know, it's all been done in a sympathetic way, which is great because from the outside, you can't really see the tunnel entrances. And uh, so I'd imagine if you flew around it, you can hardly see this ring road because it's all buried underground. But the cost of it, the money it must have cost, is unbelievable. You know, this is, I'm not going to go off on one about the European Union and, and the money that they squander on public projects like that. They, they have got a, a road system there that they could never ever have, have possibly had, even if Portugal had paid for it. And Portugal's economy is in the... Portugal is one of the pigs, isn't it? The PIGS, Portugal, um, Italy, Greece and Spain, the four countries that are in a, in a, in a real financial hole. So it's not surprising that there's no separatist movement in Portugal. They are all uh, more power to the European Union in Portugal, as far as they're concerned, because they, their economy would be, um, well, I, personally, I think their economy would be stronger outside, but they, they don't. They think that they, they're too dependent, you know, they're too dependent on the printing presses. And, uh, public, uh, you know, their, their loyalty is rewarded with large infrastructure projects, like the, uh, the Tunnel Ring Road. Anyway, I don't know what you've got booked today, but I don't know why I should know what you've got booked today. It'd be really weird, wouldn't it, if I did? But I don't even know what I've got booked today, so we'll uh, go and turn the phones on and see how it all goes. All right, it's been nice talking to you again, and uh, I'll see you soon. Bye.